Every single person has been ransomed by the Lord. But how many lost souls are stuck in a dark room? Little children don't know without the light that that door has been opened for them. How pitiful for a little child to perish in a dark room that the doors open and that they could escape from. And yet many of us have not brought the light into those little souls that are out there. And they may be in big bodies, but they're all precious to Jesus and he died for everyone. So this week we're going to reflect on O Come, Desire of Nations Bind. All peoples in one heart and mind. Can you imagine if we were all bound together with the love of the Lord and we had one heart and one mind? Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit never ever changes. So if we're in dissension and we're in disagreement, some of us may not have that full one heart and mind that only Christ can give us because we don't argue when we hear the spirit who is one inside of us. When we become one in heart and mind, we're going to bid envy, strife, and quarrels will cease. This has been a, la a couple of years of a lot of quarrels and strife and differences of opinions the devil's having a field day with that. He's dancing in the corner while everybody argues about every other thing. You need a vaccine. You don't need a vaccine. You blah, 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 blah. Stop it. All we need is God. When we have God, we've got all we need. And there's nothing, not one thing that will change our life other than him. And once we stop the envy, the strife, and the quarrels, guess what's going to happen? The last line. Fill all the world with heaven's peace. You have the ability today to take this to the Lord all week and reflect on it and say, Lord, I want to be that person. I'm tired of arguing. I'm tired of being jealous. I'm tired of quarrels. I need you. I need your mind, I need your heart so that I can speak the truth in love, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And as you do that, each person in this room, if we all went out with heaven's peace, the world will change really quickly. So I pray that over us. And then we can say, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Cindy. Oh, Lori, oh, Bob, and all the way around this whole room. For the sermon today, I wanted to speak on love that changes the world. And we're going to Matthew 2, verse 1 to 12. We're going to look at how love changed Herod's world and culture. Matthew 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod the king, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Let's reflect on that a moment. It's so easy to tell everyone that we're Christians and that we love the Lord and words flow out of our mouths real steadily and easily. But then in the same breath, we can forget that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that he sits on the throne. So if you're taking notes today, you might want to go to the Lord this week and say, what have I placed on the throne, Lord, above you? Is it my family? Is it my job? Is it my bitterness? Is it my weakness? You can find out many times where your idols are by listening to how you speak. 
If you tend to be somebody that's always complaining, perhaps you need Jesus to come in and establish his perfect peace. If you tend to be someone that holds on to bitterness and unforgiveness, perhaps you need the hope of the Lord to show you that it's not too late for you to change. If you're always sad and it's hard for you to get up and clap and, and be rejoicing, then ask the Lord for his joy because his joy is like none other. I find when I minister to the lovely people here at this church and those that walk in week by week, the joy comes into them and once they get it, nothing's going to steal it. I have seen people who have gone through tragedies and still have their joy. That's God. Now we're on love. Mm. Do you tend to be like I am sometimes? That you look at people and you make a judgment from their outward appearance? Maybe there's people you don't want to walk up to or many times, even with our overcomers, you'll hear, why don't they get a job? What's wrong with them? I don't believe God wants us to say that. I think God wants us to say thank you for sending whoever you send and may I be a blessing and a vessel of love and joy and hope and peace to each one I see. The three kings came to worship him. We can begin to worship him daily. We don't have to wait and say, oh, I wish I would have been born then. That's easy because we know the end of the story. But if you really were born then, would you believe that that was the king in a baby form, in a stable? From the parents that God gave him? Would you really believe that? Do you believe it when things happen now? Because if we are doubtful of things we see, can you imagine how doubtful we would have been at that stable? When you're a person of doubt and unbelief, you will be a person you would be a person of doubt and unbelief no matter where you are. I love it when I hear people say, I, I've got to move. I can't stand this neighborhood. I don't like the people around me. And I always say to them when I'm allowed to, I hate to tell you, but wherever you move, you're going with you. Nobody's hit me yet. But if they do, I'm, I'll recover. I'm not worried. You see, some of the things that we hate the most are things that we hate the most because they're inside of us and we don't like it. And it's so easy to look and blame others and call them what we don't like in us. We're going to close the church down this week with the exception of Wednesday when we come to decorate this beautiful home for this Christmas Eve service. And the reason that we're doing that is so that you can go home and take time to reflect on the Lord and really what the gift of him and what he did for us means. And I'll tell you, you can reflect all of 22 and you'll never get the full depth of what he did for us. I, I can bet money on that, not that I'm a betting person, but I've tried to just comprehend him and I get so lost in his vastness and his greatness, his majesty and who he is. And we can't even get that far if we're standing in the way. We have to die to self in order to live in this world with Jesus. Verse 3 says, when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. Now why? Why was he troubled? And all Jerusalem with him. So what did he do? He went and got the chief priest and the scribes, all the people together, and he inquired of them where Christ should be born. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And what's the first thing that Herod did? He lied. Oh, tell me where he is so I can go worship him. Herod had no desire to worship anybody other than himself. Who are we lying to 
even in ourself. They told him that the baby would be born in Bethlehem of Judea because the prophet said, and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are no longer least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who will shepherd my people Israel. So here they go. The kings have been told by Herod, go find him. Let me know so I can go worship him. But love changed the wise men. Love will change those of us that are seeking love, God. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, carefully inquired of them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again so that I may come and worship him also. How many times have we been deceived in our life? I know it happens to me frequently because I, I'm a positive person, so I believe everybody wants to do the right thing. But when I go to the Lord, he shows me differently many times. When they heard the king, watch this, they departed. And the star which they saw in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with great excitement. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But watch this. They ran right back to Herod, correct? No. They were warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They returned to their own country by another route. Love changes us in dreams, in visions, in reading God's word, and just sharing life and love with true people who are bringing Christ to you. It will change you. And then we need to go another route. You see, many times we think we're on path, and if we stay on that path, we're nowhere near where God wanted us to be. So the prayer of this church has become, I will go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, say what you want me to say, and give what you want me to give away. If you can do that full-heartedly, you're going to be amazed at what God does in and through you. Love comes to us through others that the Lord puts into our path. Look around this church. Look at the people that we are crazy about and love so much. I think last week was phenomenal. I can't even tell you how many people said, this is family. This church is amazing. We do not get criticized and blamed. We're treated unconditionally here. That's the love of Christ coming into us because he's put all of you in our path. And I thank God for all of you. And I want you to know that your name is on my list every day. And I go through that list and I ask the Lord to bless you and keep you and break the demonic assignments over you. Cancel those and break the curses by the blood of the Lamb. I'd like to invite Bink up and he's going to tell us about a man that touched our life and that we're all grateful. Even those of you that haven't met him, you can see in his picture isn't he a guy you'd want to know? He's an amazing man. He gave us so much love. And even more than love, he gave us laughter. How many in here went to their house last year when we went Christmas caroling? You'll see the picture.
we went and had lunch with them and in the picture it says this is church can you put that up there we were we had some of the overcomers we all just went in there that was the day we went for lunch what a and again i want to thank bink for bringing billy today <clears throat> Good morning. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read the obituary. Is what it is. And uh, there's a few things that whenever you write an obituary, oh, there we go. Well, there we go. Uh, a few things when you write an obituary, you just leave out in the moment. So I've got a couple things to add. But uh, I have to also tell you guys that I've been given permission by Cindy to read it as it is. Love me, please. Uh, Jimmy Bell Stanley Senior, and I would be Junior. Uh, 90 has joined many families and his savior in God's heavenly kingdom. Jim passed peacefully at his home in Mesa, Arizona on November 28th, as we joked and caroused while sharing stories of his life. Born well, August 4th, 1931 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I shouldn't say dad. Maybe I shouldn't say dad, or you might have to come up here and finish this up. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, Dad lived his life to the full, way too smart for formal education. Uh, Dad entered the workforce around 16 or 17 years of age. He would probably tell you it was 12. Uh, while a full list of his positions and accomplishment, uh, accomplishments are more numerous than we can recount, suffice it, suffice it to say, it was a shitload. He sold garbage disposals and televisions and washing machines and CB radios and well, a bunch of stuff. He raced cars. He raced snow machines. He sold snow machines. He drove a truck. He delivered mail. He sold some more stuff. He built houses and he moved. Man, he moved. 24 addresses since 1959, give or take maybe a couple months. Uh, he flew a plane, he fished commercially, he panned for gold. He owned a travel agency and an auto shop. And he moved and sold more stuff. And uh, he also owned a striping business uh, with my brother, and they striped uh, airport runways and highways. Uh, Dad also fancied himself a magician of, sh of sorts, and I know that some folks in this room probably were witness to a few of Dad's uh, magic tricks. He knew some wonderful card tricks, and they were fantastic. And uh, and then he knew some really crappy hidden stuff tricks too that he wasn't very good at, but he thought he was. <clears throat> Uh, Dad loved cars, he loved the classics, he loved restoring them to their formal glory. He had a number of cars displayed in shows, he built kit cars to display in shows. He not only knew how to make them look good, he knew how to make them run. Although most of the time they didn't run very well. And some of you guys might be pri privy to some of those. Uh, Dad got them in good enough shape to get them from point A to point B. And they often got from point B back to point A. We have uh, countless stories of Dad's troubleshooting expertise, and much of it was less than conventional. He loved a lot of makes and models, uh, foreign and domestic. He wasn't, uh, he, he didn't have uh, a favorite among those, but uh, uh, he did love Chevys and Fords and Dodges, and he loved Corvettes and Mustangs and Chargers. But his all-time favorite was the family of POSs. I'm going to let you guys ponder that one a little bit. Uh, he married the love of his life, uh, Bill and Margaret Wallace, on July 12, 1958. Uh, and Billy is also a girl's name, apparently not uncommon for that generation. Some of you guys will be familiar with that. Uh, he and that little gal, in quotes, uh, recently celebrated their 63rd anniversary and... Uh, um, Mom survives Dad, as do his daughters Gail Dean, and apparently also a girl's name at the time, um, Kiesa, Gail Dean Kiesa, and her husband George, and they have a uh, they have a daughter. Uh, oh wow, I've got a different version here. Um, anyway, uh, 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 Gail has a daughter. Um, Mom, I'm drawing a blank. Jennifer. 
Jennifer Hartman and her son, Lewis. Um, and he is survived by Tamala Ann, which is also the name of a boat that Dad sawed in half. <laughs> it's a long story. Uh, uh, De Philippus, Tammy De Philippus, and her husband, Joe. And uh, we always refer to Joe as the son Dad never had, even though he had two sons. <laughs> Because Joe was just a much more loving and kind person. Whereas my brother and I tend to poke fun at Dad quite a bit. Um, as you're kind of getting a glimpse of here. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, survived by me and my wife, Lori. And uh, he has uh, his daughter-in-law. My brother passed last year. So uh, he also, his daughter-in-law, Jody, um, survives Dad. Uh, she lives in Brooklyn, Texas. Uh, oh, here's the granddaughters with Jennifer. I got it out of uh, generational order. Um, and then grandkids, uh, Jennifer Hartman and her son, Morris. Um, and his last name is Norello of Carbondale, Pennsylvania. Uh, Kara D. Philippus and her fiance, Jim Stanick of St. John's, Oregon. Uh, Brooklyn Craig um, and her husband, Chad. And their sons, Easton and Cooper of Gilbert. Uh, Brittany McCulloch and her husband Brandon and their daughters, uh, their daughter Ava and their son Atticus of Twin Peaks, California, uh, Dakota DeVries and her husband Michael, and their daughter Madison and their son Mason. And Jim is survived by two grandsons, uh, Jody Philippus and his, uh, his partner Tammy Lehman. I'm using the term partner because I kind of poked fun at Joey. Um, because he hasn't proposed to her, so this was kind of a little inside joke, you know, dude, let's go, let's go, we're waiting. Um, and then uh, uh, Tyler Stanley and his wife Morgan of Etoil, Texas, and, uh, oh, and then Morgan claims Lufkin, so I don't know what that's about. So Etoil and Lufkin must be pretty close together. Um, and then... Uh, 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 oh, and Jim is, uh, dad is preceded in death by his parents, Leo Wade Stanley, and uh, Grace Irma McFarlane, and her uh, maiden name was Cook, and uh, Grace's husband, Uncle Charlie, and uh, we called him Uncle Charlie, he wasn't our uncle, but there's a story there too, I'm sure. Um, I guess it's easier to call, he, they were married before the kids were even born, so we didn't know our grandfather, dad's dad died at 30, mom? 30, 31, 35. So none of the grandkids, none of dad's kids knew his dad. So when uh, his mom remarried um, before any of us were born, so we called him uh, Uncle Charlie. I don't know why we didn't call him Grandpa. I suppose we could have. Maybe he wanted to be called Uncle Charlie. And we saw the, the lot of his grandkids. Maybe there's a reason. I don't want to go. Um, and then uh, dad's brothers, Carol Wade Stanley and William Clayton Stanley. And last year, uh, here we go. I got to think of manly things so I don't tear up. Um, and last year, Jim's son, Tim, uh, beat him to the ultimate prize. On February 10th, Timothy Keith Stanley passed, um, also with family surrounding him. Uh, Jim loved all these people, and he loved some more than others. Um, uh, but his favorite person on the planet, and some of you guys have met his favorite person, or his favorite Thing. being on the planet, was his little dog, Buddy. And a few of you have met Buddy. And uh, Dad calls him his little Yorkie mutt, but I don't think he was a Yorkie. I think he was a mutt. I'm not sure that he had much Yorkie in him. Um, and he gave unconditional love to Dad, well, as long as he was fed. Um, and, uh, and, and he... <laughs> Thank you for getting that. Um, and an excitement for life that none of the rest of us could. Um, but it wasn't like we didn't try to lick Dad's face. <laughs> I had someone ask, why'd you put that in there? I thought, why, why would I put a lot of this stuff in here? So, uh, Dad will be missed by many. He was dearly loved. And everyone who came into contact with him um, has a Jim Stanley story. Um, and their life is better for it. So, that's Dad. Amen. Thank you. You did great. <laughs> no tears. I'm going to share a Jim Stanley story because I don't know how many of you went to visit them when they lived in 
Apache Junction, but they, Jim loved dominoes. And there's many of the domino team here. Raise your hands when we'd all get together and play dominoes. And Phyllis's husband, Bruce, and Jim were a delight to watch. They, they were just an amazing team. I'm sure they're up there playing right now, Phyllis. And we think somehow Jim took the crying towel with him because we can't find it anywhere. So he probably put it in his pocket or something. In fact, I have to share this with you. I, I told Bink and Billy at the cemetery, we pulled up Monday morning because the service was Saturday, but the actual burial was Monday. And so when Rich and I pulled up, you've all heard the saying that you never see a U-Haul truck following a, a hearse, right? I'm not kidding you. The hearse was sitting there. The casket was on the burial spot. The two women from the cemetery um, or funeral home were sitting there. And Rich and I pulled up and we had to go around a Penske truck. And I said to Rich, I don't know, but maybe Jim somehow managed to get the Penske truck here, you know, it, it left before the family came because I was going to ask them about it when they got there. But that just struck me as something Jim would have gotten a big kick out of. But he invited Rich and I to come to play dominoes one time. And for those that knew him, we, we went to a church together before. Debbie was there, Vicki was there, and um, Dee and Debbie were there. And Jim would drive a motorcycle now and again. And so, you know, and he was up in age. He was 90 when he passed, so he was up in age with this motorcycle, but he was proud as anything of this motorcycle. So, one day, he invites Rich and I to go to his house to play dominoes. So we accept it, and we're driving, and we're following the GPS, and it says, turn right, and we turned right, and the street completely vanished. It became dirt. And so here we are in Rich's vehicle, and I'm like, oh my gosh, these poor people, they ride a motorcycle on this road to get to the grocery store, to get to church. Oh, and, and the further we went, I mean, the car had to go up and around. There was horse poop. There was like, I mean, we were off-roading. And the car is getting filthy, and Rich is like, oh man, I... And I'm just, I'm befuddled. I'm, I'm so sad for these old people that have to drive this road every time they go anywhere. And then I kept saying, and he brings her on a motorcycle on this? And so finally, there was a little asphalt, a house, and then their house. And we got there. And I mean, our car was absolutely filthy. Mud, you know, dirt. So we... We knocked on the door and they weren't home, so I called them and they said, oh, we're at the store. And I'm thinking, oh, good Lord, they got to come through that to get back home. And uh, they said, just sit on the porch, we'll be there shortly. And we were waiting for another couple. And all of a sudden, this couple pulled up and their car's clean. And they came from a different direction. And I went, how in the earth did you get here? And they said, well, we took the street right there. And I said, a street? And they said, yeah. And I go, how did we come? And they go, oh, my gosh. Everyone laughed. When Jim got there, he goes, I forgot to tell you one thing. Don't follow the GPS. <laughs> I'll never forget that. We laughed about that so often. But um, we just had a great time with Billy and Jim and all of our group. Um, we met every Thursday and played Domino's, he loved to go to Village Pizza or Village Inn um, before uh, Richard would meet us with Pat, and we just had a great time, didn't we, guys? So I'd like to bring Richard up right now. Well You don't want to? Richard uh, is our charter member of the church. That's what he calls himself. When you see the Table of Grace video, Richard's in that first service. He 
when we prayed at the pole a couple years ago, I announced to the church that we're going to pray at the flagpole. And we got there in the morning, and there was Richard in his red bird car. Where do you want me to go? Standing, uh, whichever way is easier. <laughs> Good job, sir. <laughs> Here we go. Bring your seat. All right. There you go. I got it. Can you sit here? Okay. So have a seat. I want to tell people about you. Now I'm on everything. <laughs> Are you going to pay me to do that? Or? <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say. Richard, we met at our other church. He lived down the street from that church. And he saw the pastor, uh, or the pastor saw him cleaning up the yard and cutting the grass. And Richard became a mainstay. We've been together a long time, haven't we, buddy? And um, he is a cowboy poetry man, and he loves to do his poetry. So thank you, Mark and Sharon, his children, for bringing him today. They didn't even question it. I called them and I said, we're gonna honor Jim Stanley. Can you get Richard here? And here he is. I'll hold this for okay, you. Okay, I'll see if I can do this all right. I'd like to be at mom's kitchen table again. And the surrounding is when I was a kid. Life seemed easy, worries were few, and mom found good in all we did. We gathered around the table each morning and again at the end of the day. Mom would make sure we washed and cleaned before bowing our heads in prayer. The table was long and a bit narrow, but it fit as kids just fine, along with dad, mom, and a hired hand, and a border from time to time, made from plank from four-inch pine, scraps, from when the barn was built. A leg on each corner and another in the middle. Sturdy, strong, and stout. Benches split from cottonwood, running along each side. Rough, now worn smooth, but polished over time. At the head of the table, Dad's chair was set. Mom's at the other end. As for Dad, missed the meal, and she'd fix the plate, then take the bench next to him. A center for family gatherings. The good book might be read at night, where life and discussions were commonplace by the glow of a coal oil light. Figuring out which field to plant, which calves to send up, sail, horses to work, cows to coal, which field to cut and bale. At the table is where quilts were made, peas were peeled, peaches canned, where wild berries and Cactus apples were preserved for jellies and jams. It's where Uncle Ben in agony was laid when fighting wrestlers he got shot, where the doctors labored into the night to dig the bullet out. A workbench for mending saddles, where saddles were studies where the day's work was done. There was a hole where Dad had shot her when he claimed he was cleaning his gun. It was a preacher set to visit when sister was to be wed and where the family was called together to get the news. Grandpa had died. Family discussions, plans laid out where me was prepared for the smoker, laundry was folded, gifts were wrapped, and an occasional game of matchstick poker. It's 
supported Dad's arms, holding his head when the spring crop didn't come through, late frost, hot winds, or blight of bugs. There was little anyone could do, for a proud man confessed the shortcoming of his life to the one woman with the willing ear, his darling, my mother, his wife, where Sunday's meals of wild turkey or beef were served as a festive feast, and music around that table were made to the tapping of tired feet. Now there's a quiet rem remembrance, stories told with laughter and tear, and gathering at the tables been part of it all, spanning those decades of years. At Mom's kitchen table, great lessons were learned, more than at school, work or church, lessons of life, respect and caring, the lessons of a family worth. Do you remember the one about visiting a friend? Can you do that by heart? No. Not anymore? I don't think so. All right. No. Well, God uh, bless you. Down a two-lane gravel road of peace, not far beyond the bend, there's a place I love to visit, because that fella is my friend. Now and then I go to see him, and it always makes my day. But no matter why I'm bothered, he takes my care of me. Come on, I'll introduce you. And you can walk the path I we trod. I think you really like my friend. By the way, his name is God. You can do it, buddy. We believe in you. I just started reading this stuff just a few years ago. My mother was a poet, and after she passed away, I started reading poetry. But th this guy here was, was a personal friend of mine. And when Richard's wife, Carol, went to heaven, and I, our church was loaded. It was the biggest celebration of life we ever had. All the poetry and cowboys and your RV team. And and but I've been to yes. New yes. Mexico. I've been to New Mexico to his house and had dinner with him. So I got to do the poem for him personally. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to pray over Richard. I've got so many little things in my life that has been a big welcome to me. And one of them has been to help Sunday start this church. Yeah. Yeah. You're the very first service, and we're so happy you're here. I want to pray over you. Would everyone raise their hands? We're going to pray for Richard. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the precious gift of Richard. How old are you now, Richard? Oh, I don't know. 94. 87? Oh, my. 94. <laughs> I don't know. 87 or 34. You can say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. We'll just believe you. How's that? He's 29, and he's doing really well. Lord, uh, you have blessed me and this church with the gift of this man. Now I pray an anointing over him and his family that will last him all through the rest of his journey of life. And when he closes his eyes to this world, I pray, Lord, that you're standing in front of him and that he looks up into your beautiful eyes and he, said, he hears you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Richard, we love you and I pray for you. Thank you, Mark, for bringing him. You guys are a blessing to us at this church. God bless you. Oh, my bones and arms. <laughs> 
So anyone else that would like to share a gym story? Wake up in the morning every morning and I say, Lord, we got two choices today. We can have a good day or a bad day. And he's always said that, Lord. We got two choices. I can make it a good day or a bad day. Amen. Yeah, and then I can go see Cindy. <laughs> Who else wants to share a Jim Stanley story? We've got plenty of them. <laughs> As we go through the final thoughts here, I want to just tell you what the Lord put on my heart when I talked to Jim's family at the celebration of life. You see, Jim lived on this earth for 90 years, and he had a relationship with so many of us, as you've experienced even today. And we know him, and though he may not be walking on the earth, when we tell others about Jim, it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So as the children tell their children in the book of Joel, verse one, chapter, chapter one, verse three says, tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. That is what love is and what love does. You see, they said they never met their grandfather, but he knew about his grandfather because somebody told him about his grandfather. Do you realize that we had a relationship with Jim? But many of us in here, I hope all of us, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And how did we find out about that? Because somebody told us. And so as we get ready to leave here today, let's remember that we have brothers and sisters who are still ransomed, the price is paid, and they're still sitting in darkness. Let's take the light. Let's take that light out and let them know that they're set free. And as we do, God's word will just penetrate. It never comes back void. And so it's our job to tell others about the truth about Jesus just like we tell others about the truth about Jim. You see, as generations die off, Jim may not be remembered so much. But look at the miracle that 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ is still strong and alive and in us. And we feel it. Do you feel it? I mean, this is something to rejoice about. If we are Christians and we go around looking like we've just sucked on a lemon, who is going to want to have what we have? Let's get joyful. Let's go out of this place and tell others about how Jesus has changed your life by bringing Jim Stanley into it, by bringing Barb Redman into it, by bringing Robert into it, by knowing each other and sharing what Jesus does that's what keeps us alive in him. We need each other. We cannot be isolated. If we just stay by ourselves, we lose that loving sense of hope and peace and joy and love. So I just pray as more of us go to be with Jim in heaven, his stories will fade, but that doesn't change the fact that Jim was here. And Jim was a loving and hardworking man. And I pray as we reflect on that this week, that we're going to reflect on Jesus, who is alive today, who is alive tomorrow, who is alive forever. Though we knew Jesus, let's continue to tell his stories. We have Jesus' stories today. I feel him today. Let's go tell others. When we see somebody broken like Sonia, who came, just happened to come to the door on Thursday when Pam and I were entering for Bible study. This strange lady just walks in the church as I open the door. And I said, I'm Cindy. And she said, I'm Sonia. And she said, is this the thrift store? And I said, no, but we do have a little gift shop. So she went shopping and she came out. She looked at Pam. This stuff, like Krista said, you can't make this up. She went, are you Pam? Here, this woman 
was a, an acquaintance of Pam's from several years back. Her husband went to be with the Lord a year ago in December. It was her first year back in Arizona. And Pam and I were able to take this precious lady into the prayer room and pray with her. And she was touched, and so were we. That's Jesus. Don't miss the chances. Let's continue to meet Jesus through his loving word, his living word that never dies, and then take it and just love others. That's all we have to do. It's not really that hard. Unfortunately, it's a little selfish because the more love you give out, the happier you are. So it's a it's a win-win. I just thank God for each and every one of you today.